Welcome to Madame Ravens. This way to the library. She's been expecting you. Two Skinwalker Stories by Ashkey Ninety. Driving late at night. This story happened to my sister, who is a traveling registered nurse. Her occupation takes her all over the Navajo reservation. So most times, her husband, when he's available, will drive her from and to her next shift. She worked the night shift mostly. They've never shared a ghost story before this or since. It was between 2.45 and 3 a.m. in the summertime. If you're from the res, you know that most nights are arid, with a slight cool breeze. Well, she had finished her shift in Tuba City sometime around midnight, and her husband was driving. Her next job was in Chinle, Arizona, so they decided to go through Cayente. They were driving on that stretch of desolate highway between Round Rock and Lukachukai. The streetlights from the Helms are scattered in the, in the horizon miles apart, and most times it's just pitch black. She was half asleep, but alert because of all the caffeine in her system and the fact that she is used to being awake all night because of her job. They had not seen another vehicle for an hour or so, and were not familiar with the area, having only driven through the area a few times. She said they were driving on the road, and in front of them, probably about a football field's length, she noticed something splattered across the two-lane highway. She said it was dark. Roadkill or dead livestock on the road is a common thing on the reservation due to poor fencing and highway maintenance. She figured it looked familiar, but not out of place as they got closer. She said she remembered the shimmer of the dark matter, like wet pavement. She thought to herself, it must be recent blood splatter if it's still wet. Her eyes began darting across the landscape and trying to assess the damage. Looking for the animal carcass, the blood puddle spanned the width of the entire highway. She thought it had to have been from a large animal like a cow or horse, but she couldn't locate the large bloated carcass of any livestock. Something didn't feel right. As rural as the location was, and how recent the seemingly wet blood was, she figured no one could have been there that quickly to dispose of the roadkill. As soon as she came to this conclusion in her head, she said her instincts took over. She felt like someone kicked her in the stomach, like the ground falling out beneath you, or the way you feel dropping on a roller coaster, but no joyous emotion. It felt bad or evil. She jolted upright and began to scan the dark horizon for any clues. Her husband later said he didn't want to scare her, but came to the same conclusion silently to himself. She said the blood froze and her heart skipped a beat when she made out a silhouette, slowly rising on the left shoulder of the highway. Her mind began to race with what it could possibly be. We haven't passed any vehicles in a long time, and we are far from the nearest residence. What could be out in the middle? of nowhere, this late and this isolated. It was standing upright and facing the opposite direction. Her husband begins to speed up as they near it. She doesn't want to look because everything about this situation seems wrong, and she doesn't want to see something she can't unsee. Too late it is in her peripheral and she doesn't want to close her eyes, because she said that would be more terrifying. Her eyes stay straight ahead, but her curiosity gets the best of her, and her eyes wander off to the left. As the headlights hit the silhouette, 
almost full on. <coughs> she said it looked like a person standing there, wrapped in a white sheet. A white sheet that had been splattered with blood. The figure stands completely stoic, not flinching or shuddering from the lights of the vehicle. The figure seems to have shoulder-length black hair that looks jaggedly cut. She said the way the hair hung off the head of the figure, it looked matted or greasy and not free-flowing or clean. They are passing the figure, her husband trying to stay on the pavement, but the furthest away from the left shoulder of the road will allow. She can't make out the face because the figure has its head bowed down and the hands out in front of it in a prayer stance. Neither of them speak. Her mind is rushing with the thoughts, like what if the vehicle stopped working, or what if whatever it was started chasing us? Who would be able to help us? They made it to the next intersection towards many farms. A sigh of relief. That's one of the reasons Navajo elders tell you never to drive after dark or really late. Something wicked this way comes. This story recollects what happened during the Navajo Nation Fair season, 2015. My roommate and her boyfriend decided to head back to the reservation to take part in the festivities, rodeo, parade, and carnival. My roommate was the offspring of divorced parents and spent her teenage years half on the reservation in Window Rock, Arizona, with her mother, and half with her father in Phoenix. She was raised as a devout Catholic, even attending Catholic school. Nothing paranormal had ever occurred to her in her lifetime, up until this point. Her boyfriend was an urban Navajo who was Christian, having been born and raised off the reservation in Phoenix, Arizona. I'm declaring their religious ideologies and affiliations because neither of them believed in Navajo traditionalism or ghost stories. Late one evening, after both of them got off work, they decided to head out to make the most of the three-day fair weekend. My roommate had made prior accommodations with a good friend from high school. When my roommate was a young adult, her mother decided to move away from the res. If her mother had still lived in Window Rock, she would have simply stayed there. The accommodations were as follows. Her good friend opted to stay at a close relative's and offer her two-bedroom, two-bath manufacture home at their disposal. The trailer was located off the road between St. Michael's and the first four-way intersection. The first intersection past KTNN when you are heading towards Window Rock from Summit. Many have called it the back road to St. Michael's. The old original township of St. Michael's, that is. As you can imagine, they arrived to their Navajo Fair, B&B, pretty late. The trailer was off to the right of the main highway and was situated at the foot of a large rolling hill. There was no street light. First order of business. My roommate calls her friend to let her know that they arrived safely. They walk up to the trailer and unlock the door and give themselves a tour of their accommodations. They turn on all the lights in every single room as they toured. My roommate had driven the entirety of the journey home, so she was a bit more fatigued than her partner. She asked him to go get the luggage from the car. It was a hatchback. The car was parked about 40 feet away. She explained to me that it had rained some weeks before, and the dirt road leading up to the house was wrecked. To avoid bottoming out, she had parked on level ground. She walks into the guest room, and her boyfriend is already laid out on the bed, 
She pleads with him to go get the luggage, and most importantly, her makeup bag, so she can remove her makeup before bed. She compromises with him and that she'll go out with him if he does the heavy lifting. She doesn't want to put her heels back on, so she decides to watch him from the porch. Yes, heels. She works at a bank and had to always dress professionally, in a pantsuit and heels. So as she's standing on the top stair of the small three-stair porch, with the front door slightly ajar, her hand on the doorknob, her boyfriend walks off into the pitch black. The light from his cell phone serves as the only beacon of light, signaling his location. As she watches his light grow dimmer and smaller in the distance, she hears what seems to be a pack of dogs howling and barking. She said it sounded like a rumble. A pack of feral res dogs or coyotes fighting. The pack of dogs come barreling down the large hill behind the trailer. She hears a loud thud against the back wall of the trailer. The thud was so loud she heard the rattling of the picture frames that were hanging. At this point, fear begins to creep into her mind. She calls out for her boyfriend and hears no response. She shouts for him once again. That's when she realizes the dogs have all gone silent. All at once, in a fluid succession of motions, she said that something from inside the trailer slams the front door so fast that it creates a gust of wind. She said that if she hadn't been holding on to the doorknob, it would have knocked her off the landing of the front steps. The front porch light flickers and goes dead. She's standing there barefoot in the darkness. She tries to open the door and retreat back into the trailer. She was unable to turn the doorknob until it clicked. The door wasn't locked. Something heavy was pressed up against the flimsy manufactured hollow core door from the inside. At this point, she said she didn't realize she was crying at the brink of an anxiety attack. Adrenaline took over and she began to throw herself and all her weight against the door. She said once she saw it, inch open, and the light from inside flood the doorway for a split second before it slammed shut in retaliation. Fight or flight, she decides to run barefoot into the darkness to find her boyfriend. His account. He leaves his girlfriend at the top of the front door steps as he walks off into the dark, with only his phone serving as flashlight. He is being very careful where he steps because the earth is turned up and twisted and gnarled. Deep ruts and grooves from a vehicle driving in the mud before it hardens into a crust. He's afraid he might twist his ankle. He, too, hears the frenzied howling and barks from the dogs. He turns around to look at where the sounds are coming from. In the distance, he sees the faint light of the porch light go off. He rationalizes to himself that the dog's barking frightened his girlfriend, and in fear she ran inside and unintentionally turned the porch light off. He continues walking in the direction of the car. He hears the thud of heavy footsteps behind him, mimicking his own stride, not exactly in tune with his, following a split second after his own thud, almost echoing his own intentionally, figuring it might be his frightened girlfriend running out to find him. He calls out for her to no avail. He sees a dim flicker in the distance, the light from his phone bouncing off the reflection of the tail light of the car. His body floods with relief. Relief quickly drains to despair. His phone erratically dies. His heartbeat almost beats out of his chest. How could this be? He wasn't on his phone the entire drive back. It was fully charged. 
He takes a few urgent paces towards where the car was before the lights turned off. His palms are sweaty, and he swears he could feel his heartbeat pounding in his hands. He desperately reaches into his pockets for the car keys. He begins frantically pressing all the buttons, the lock, the unlock, panic, and open hatchback buttons. Nothing. He even stretches out his hand in the dark as he presses the buttons. Thinking he's on the cusp of the electronic radius of the vehicle to respond. Still nothing. The footsteps behind him hastened and almost sounded like he was going to be charged from the back. He's too terrified to look back. At this point, he realizes the dread he feels in the pit of his stomach means something unnatural. His shoulders drop as if he instinctually braces for some sort of impact. The sound of heavy footsteps would indicate that he should have been hit by now. Nothing. The footsteps loudly lead directly up to him, to his heels, and nothing. He opens his eyes. He hears something like a coin drop and hit the top of the car. He turns around to the patter of bare feet on the dirt road. His girlfriend charges into a full embrace, hugging him and burying her face into his chest. Mind you, his feet stay planted. He doesn't take one step forward or back. The car keys are still in his hands. His thumb presses down. A loud click. The familiar sound of the hatchback automatically opening and the light from inside the car quickly floods their immediate surroundings. They grab their luggage and a pair of flip-flops from the car and slowly make their way back to the trailer. Oddly, the porch light is on now. My roommate makes her boyfriend go inside and check all the rooms before she goes back in. He opens the door with ease. He checks each room meticulously. There's no one inside. All the windows are still locked from the inside. I've never retold this account to anyone, but I thought I would finally share it before time and life erase all the details from my memory. Once in the safety of the trailer, her boyfriend pulled out his cell phone, and it turned on to the same battery percentage. They corroborated their experiences to recount what happened to each. Both of them are dumbfounded at the fact that both of them were shouting at the top of their lungs for the other one at one time or another, but neither of them said they heard the others yell. Growing up on the res, you hear your fair share of skinwalker and ghost stories, but this was the first time I heard one where the perpetrator manipulated electronics to a great extent, or even at all. This was also the first case where the perpetrator manipulated sound waves. Both of them swore that they were easily in earshot of each other, but weren't allowed to hear the other's cries. There was no structures or trees between them. Collecting the sound waves, he heard the pack of dogs, but wasn't allowed to hear her screaming out for him. What also spurred me to share this was the massive amount of questioning from some Reddit users. If they exist, why haven't they been filmed or caught on camera? Skinwalkers are just as modern as you and me. Wicked as much as they may be, they're not stupid, and deal with smartphones and technological advances as much as anyone. They walk the world as normal people during the day. So quoth this raven. I'd like to thank my Patreon supporters, Ermin Case, Darren and Jennifer Da, and Calist Enoch. And thank you, all my darlings, 
I love you all so much and appreciate you listening to my little stories. If you like this, please hit the little button to let me know. If you didn't, hit the little button to let me know. Leave a comment. I'm always glad to talk with you, my darlings. I'm open to suggestions and criticisms, critiques. If you have not subscribed, please do so and ring the little bell so you know when to come up and see me. And I will talk to you next time, my darlings. <laughs> Farewell. <laughs>